They said that there was a cabal or a conspiracy of rich and powerful people that controlled our government from behind the scenes. That can't be. We are the ones who control our representatives. We are the sovereigns in our nation, not the government. Why don't you sponsor a bill to get rid of No Child Left Behind? For sure. It's a Thought Police Free Zone, the Liberty Lineup Radio Show, where independent thought just can't be bought. I'm an American. Welcome to the Thursday segment of the Liberty Lineup with Ben McClintock and Enoch Moore of DefendingUtah.org. This is the Naked Truth segment, and today we have a show for you. We're going to be, the first hour, we're going to be talking about the lands transfer and what's going on with that, and then the second hour, you need to bring your everybody together. We'll be talking about um, with about the uh, book, Hiding in Plain Sight, with Ken Bowers. We'd like to thank our show sponsor, EOS Mobile, the only cell phone service that supports conservative candidates and causes. Really go to E-O-S-C-E-L-L dot com for more information and mention the Liberty Lineup radio show. Also, did did you know that you can listen to this show from anywhere online through k-talk.com? You can access our calendar and join our chat room. You can also like our Facebook page at K-Talk Utah and post photos to Instagram at KTalk Radio and tweet our handle at KTKK. And best of all, download the KTalk app through iTunes or Google Play. Last month alone, KTalk was heard in 82 countries. Help us spread liberty around the globe. So today on the show, like I mentioned, we're the first. The, if you haven't heard about the lands transfer and what's going on here, you. This is one of those things where you have a lot of bait and switch going on. We've got a lot of false alternatives going on. Enoch, we've been talking about this. This is something that this is a uh, subject that you really started the investigation on about what's what's really going on with the lands transfer. Sometimes, if you're against, you think the lands transfer, people think you might be a, a liberal, and so it's important that we understand what's really going on with the lands transfer. Before we go ahead, so, so we can talk about the basis for the lands transfer. Really, is enumerated powers at the federal level. Right. right? That, that's, a, that's a key part of it right there. But before we get into that, I, I was on the way to the show this morning. I had some thoughts I really wanted to, to get out there about. And it's, it's, it is tied to the lands issue and just the, uh, the, uh, what the Constitution says and what it's all about and what the federal government has the authority and what it doesn't have the authority to do based on principle. People have been talking a lot about um, the right to health care. And the government, through Obamacare, there's, in fact, uh, Idaho, I'm not Idaho, Hawaii just passed a uh, call for a convention of states to make Obamacare a part of the Constitution. They want to make, their, their idea is they want to make um, health care a fundamental right given to us by the government. Now, our Constitution, our government, is different than every, any other government on the planet of the Earth. Our government is founded upon the idea that the our rights... planet of the earth. <laughs> is, ...is founded upon the idea that our rights come from God and that government's role is to protect those rights. Okay? Every other nation in existence is based on the, the, the principle of the divine rights of kings where your rights come from them when they're in a good mood. They're like, ah, today, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll let you get away with this or I'll let you get away with that. So th- that's... Those are the foundations of our nation. Our, our, our foundation is our rights come from God, and the government's only role is to protect those rights. And so the Constitution, you've got Article 1, Section 8, it has 
the specific delegated duties to the federal government. The Constitution was not a set of laws on us. It was actually a set of regulations that, or limits on the government. They were limited to doing certain things. Okay, So and then you have the Bill of Rights, which lays out, because the anti-federalists were like, okay, if these aren't protected, if these aren't enumerated, then we're going to have a repeat of, everything, of every other part of history in the world. And so we've got to put these first ten amendments in there to make sure that the, the government realizes and we don't forget that they're not allowed to do these things. And so, and, and I think that's our biggest problem is that as a people, we've forgotten they're not they're not allowed to do these things. And and that's kind of what we're as a nation we're we're getting back to somewhat. Yeah, we're having a, a there's an awakening going on of of these correct principles. And so you've got a list of of thou shalt nots. You, you can't limit my religion. You can't limit my speech. You can't limit my ability to protect my family with weapons. You can't do this. You can't do that. And ninth and 10th say, you know, if we forgot to list anything, you can't do that either. And so just think of those rights. We have the right, you know, we, even though it's a list of thou shalt nots, we know from these things we have the right to bear arms. Okay? So just linking this to health care, they say I have a right to health care, so that means the government has to provide it. Let's look at our other rights that we know that we have from the Bill of Rights and say, does the government provide those things? I have a right to bear arms. Does that mean the government provides me with a new gun every week or every month or every year? No, it just means they're not going <laughs> to stop you from going out and getting they one on your own. They can't stop me from getting one, right? Right. And the same thing with speech, okay? Uh, it, because I have the right to, to my freedom of speech, does that mean that the government is going to fund this radio program? Does that mean that the government is going to – I need to, to print some flyers. Uh, do I go to the government and have them print those flyers for me? It just means they can't stop you they can't if you stop decide me. to go do that. It's a list of thou shalt nots. How about my church? Does the government um, send a check to my church every month? To, if I want to start a church, are they going to fund me to start my church? No, this is a list of thou shalt nots. I have a right to these things, and so the same thing well, with Well, that healthcare. depends. If you're, if you're preaching about evolution in public schools, they'll fund you. Right. If I'm, if I'm a government school, which is a.k.a. government church— then they'll fund it, but <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the one exception. But that's the, that's that's not supposed to be that way, right? Right. And so, um, and so we need to understand that. Say, okay, let's let's concede that we have a right to health care. Therefore, the government cannot get in our way. They they don't provide us with these things. They can't get in our way. So if I have a right to health care, that means that the government can't stop me. It means you have a right to seek out your healthcare. own health care, right? As as part of your um, pursuit of happiness. Exactly. Your life, liberty, and pr and pursuit of happiness. I've got the right to life. Right. Does that mean that the government provides me with a house, with food? It means they just don't they can't get, get, in my way. get in your way of, of pursuing <laughs> your life. And so we need to really understand these principles of thou shalt not, because if the government is providing us with these things, that means they can take us away. We become a foundation of every other nation where our rights come from the government as opposed to God. And so that means if, okay, the, the government gives us our right to religion and they start providing us, that means all of a sudden they can control it and they can take that away from us at any time. You know, and that's how it works in communist countries, right? When the LDS church asked the Chinese government, for example, to have permission to have churches in there, ultimately their answer was, yes, as long as we can provide your leadership. Right. right. Which doesn't quite work. <laughs> Yeah, well, that, that's how they got the Dalai Lama to go along because they, they put in there. And so, it, yeah, if, so in those countries, they get to put the leaders in. And so it's, they have the, the, the freedom, of, just like in the Soviet Union, they had the right to a loaf of bread. Right, and I think Ezra Taft Benson said that even though these things are guaranteed, were guaranteed in the old Soviet constitution, they were more abundant in the United States where they were not guaranteed. Exactly. So if we have the uh, the call in no number is 801-254-5855 801-254-5855 So with the lands transfer what do you think about the lands transfer do you, what do you think about Ken Ivory's plan or what do you think is the federal government uh, managing our lands appropriately should the federal government have it are these our only solutions I mean our only options do we say do we just have the federal government the, the you know the uh, the current mode of operations, the, the current status quo of allowing them to control it, or do we, or is the only other option do what Ken Ivory's doing with the lands transfer? 
Well, I think to answer that question, we probably need to understand what exactly is Ken Ivory doing. Right. And we can probably figure that out by looking at his own bills. The language of the bills. And uh, – <laughs> Reading, reading legislation is not usually the most exciting thing on the planet, but uh, well, I think with this one, it's it's so egregious that it can be interesting. Right, it can be interesting, <laughs> right? So, so let's back up and talk about the federal government's option. The first option: should we just leave everything alone and allow them to control all the land? And and ultimately, you, you can make an argument over whether it's whether they're doing a good job or not doing a good job. You know why they should or shouldn't, but. If you ultimately go back to correct principles and the enumerated powers of the Constitution, right? What are the things that the federal government um, is authorized? What to are do. they allowed to do? Right? It's I tell my kids this. You know, what's enumerated powers? I quiz them. It's a list of things they're allowed to do. If it's if something is not on that list, they can't do it. It's it is illegal under our Constitution for them to do something not in the list of enumerated powers. So. Can the, gov- the federal government own land under enumerated powers? Is there an enumerated power? They, they have – it's for a very limited use. It's, it's for a purpose. They, have, they can use it for, you know, the, uh, what was it, uh, so forts? There's no, specific, right, there's no specific thing over generally you can or you can't own land. There's no generic statement of that, right? Right. But, right. but, but there are things, right, like you, like you started to mention, forts and, and certain, certain very limited – situations where they're allowed to own land and if the land they own does not fall within those specific parameters which which there's maybe one percent of the land i don't know it's <laughs> tiny now right, but actually right. it probably falls within that <laughs> if you looked so then it's simply illegal for them to own that land and if it's illegal then they're opposite rating outside the law i wonder is there an amendment that says, hmm, if we didn't tell the federal government they have this power, then by default that power falls with someone else. Hmm. Mm. <laughs> if you know the answer to that, it's call. <laughs> <laughs> tenth Amendment. Ninth and Tenth Amendment. If you if we didn't mention it, you can't do it and it's left to the people. And so in fact, so there's there's no there is no clause in the Constitution, there's no segment of the Constitution that says they're authorized to just own land for open space. There's no one in the Constitution that says that they um, can have um, uh, national parks, for example. They're, they, they're not authorized to do those things. So if you work for the Forest Service, I'm sorry, I'm sure you're a good person, but you're not enumerated. <laughs> but you're not. <laughs> I, I, Your job is unconstitutional. Right, and I'm sure you're a great guy, and, and actually I, I love camping and I love the outdoors <laughs> myself. But if we're going to act constitutionally, at a minimum, you have to at least start at the state level. At a minimum. Minimum. Right? And then we can continue the conversation to see, is that, there. Is that, is that proper role of government? Is that principle? Right. But it's definitely unconstitutional. If we're going to start there with what's constitutional. It's definitely unconstitutional. Some people will say, well, what about the general welfare clause? It's for our general welfare. Well, if, if that was the case. The, the general welfare clause, actually that statement of general wel- welfare – was an introductory sentence to a list of enumerated powers within that <laughs> Specific, clause. Specific, right, right. So, so the idea of general welfare is not an actual power that our <laughs> government has. That was, that was the introduction to the section of enumerated powers that fall within general welfare, which by definition back in the, the dictionary at the time of the founders meant the happiness of the nation. It, right. it wasn't free stuff. Free. <laughs> and cause can you imagine if that was what it, what it meant? We've got 15 seconds to break. We're having so much fun. <laughs> can you imagine? So, okay, I want to talk about this call. Say 801-254-5855. What would happen if the general welfare clause actually meant that they could – if they could make it up then, and say it was for our welfare, then they could do it? This has been McClintock and Enoch Moore on the Naked Truth segment of the Liberty Lineup, where we focus on right and wrong, not right and left. We'll be right back talking more about the land transfer and the federal government's authority under the Constitution. Ben McClintock and Enoch Moore of DefendingUtah.org. We are back on K Talk Radio, AM630K-Talk.com with the Liberty Lineup. 
the Naked Truth segment, sponsored by EOS Mobile, the cell phone service for conservatives. And we've been talking about the lands transfer and the proper role of government. And how can we tell what the proper role of government is? Well, especially with the, with the federal level, we have a, a, a little guide, this thing called the, the Constitution. I, I think a few of us might have heard of it. Hopefully, the, I don't think our guys in the federal government or maybe even the state legislature have heard of it, but, but it's, it's there. And it's, it's, the, uh, it's basically the delegated duties to the federal government, what they're allowed to do. Maybe we should remind, remind uh, <laughs> legislators that when they, t- they took an oath, that was not a dream. And that thing that they called the Constitution, it was real. It actually exists. <laughs> and they can it, read it. it. So it was not a dream. And it has words that have specific meanings. Right. And, there's, and it's, supposed to, it's supposed to regulate your behavior as you make laws. Yours meaning government. The legislators, right? The, the, not, n- not the people's, not, not, <laughs> not the people's behavior, right? It's quite the opposite. And so, and and then, and then it says in the, in the, the Bill of Rights, the first, which, if you didn't know, or the first ten amendments, are what you know you're not allowed to do. So if you're like, okay, you, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And if we forgot anything, ninth and tenth, we you can't do that either. And so, with in the news recently, they had a, they had a press conference about the. Uh, transfer on public lands and and what that means and so we've got two options are being presented to us but what are the are those are those both are they are they the only options available are they are they both principled options well we know that the first option based on our discussion meaning what what we have now the federal government managing these wilderness spaces and and national parks etc right that that option is is invalid because it's complete. It's not enumerated. It's not enumerated. They're not allowed to do it. And we talked about how we, right when we went to the break of, so people will say the general welfare clause um, gives them the authority. And so can you imagine if the general welfare clause meant if you can figure out a reason why this helps us, then you can do it. Then the rest of the Constitution really wouldn't have been needed, right? It's totally irrelevant. You could have been right. like two, two, two sentences or one sentence says, you know, the general, for the general welfare. And, the, and if, if you can th- find out why it's for our general welfare, you can do it. You could have had – our entire Constitution could have said, just do whatever makes sense. <laughs> whatever, do whatever you want, and if it makes sense and people like it, then, then go for it. But that's not – that's that's not what it means. Otherwise, they wouldn't have the enumerated powers. Right. Otherwise, we'd have an unlimited government that could do whatever it wanted to do. But we know through the courts that well, that the things that are ruled unconstitutional, whether or not they're passed under the claim of being for our general welfare. And so that that's not what it means. It mean, and so we understand that these are specific enumerated powers. All right, so that option doesn't work. Should we take a call let's, before we move on let's, to the let's rest do of it. the discussion? Let's see. Randy, oh. are you there? Randy? Oh, did we lose Randy? Okay, one second. Hopefully we're working on that. Okay. Is that Randy? Can you hear me? I can hear you, Randy. Okay, good. Uh you're on a subject that's uh, dear to me because I've fought battles in that arena. And, uh, well, just the most recent one here, the state of Utah made a lot. There was a, a court case uh, about five years ago. Was, the name of the court case was called Conister uh, versus uh, Johnson. And this is where a guy was floating down the Weber River, and he hit a sandbar with his raft. And he uh, got out to uh, move the raft over the sandbar, and there were some people that owned the property adjacent to where he was at. And they started uh, pointing guns at him and telling him to get off their property, that they owned the land under the uh, uh, stream, and the, the, the sheriff came and arrested him. But he took it all the way up to the state Supreme Court, and the state Supreme Court ruled that <clears throat> there's a... The, the water is a public resource, and they had a, and they had a right to use it. But then the, the Utah legislature turned around and made a law saying, oh, no, we, we control all of this. Well, a, a consortium of uh, outdoor recreational users, uh, including fishermen, they, they countersued 
the state. And they just won this lawsuit a month or two ago, uh, stating that the, uh, uh, the people have a, a right to this. But the point I'm making there is the state of Utah always favors the big interests when they, when they get their uh, uh, hands involved in it. Mm-hmm. And, and if you look back through history of the state of Utah, I, I also fought a battle up at the state legislature to lobby to get someone on what at the time was called the state land board. And the state land board comprised of all special interests who used the state land, like mining interests and uh, ranching in- interests and people that, that extracted and got uh, uh, a benefit unto themselves out of the state land, and it was supposed to be managed for the schools. Right. Uh, under Thomas Jefferson's act, you know, of uh, surveying the land and, and, and putting it for the best use of the people. Uh, and I think the state of Utah has always usurped this uh, uh, responsibility that they have for managing the land. And, and, this, and if, you read the, if you go back and read the history, you'll see that the first state that got some of these lands, well, there were some back in the east, but we're talking about the western lands out here, which are very dry and, you know, right. desolate in a lot of places. Right. They have lands that are totally covered by 12 feet of snow uh, most of the winter, you know. Right. Uh, so they do have values, but they're not anything like the uh, east was. So we'll leave the east out of this equation for now, but... Uh, uh, the state of Nevada was one of the first western states to come in, and, and they got the, the school lands uh, allocated to them. Mm-hmm. And uh, they... We just got a couple about, of minutes. Okay, they about lost everything out there that was supposed to give public good. It, 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 it reverted into the hands of the special interests, the ranching. And, and as time went on, Congress tightened up the rules for these states. And the state, one of the last ones was New Mexico that came in, New Mexico pays for all of their education in that state with these lands. But Utah was about in the middle, so we've we've been screwed out of about 50% of the lands that the state got their hands on. And guess who managed the land that told these states how they were going to do it? It was the federal government. Right. And it was people that were uh, aside from the interests within that state. It was a guy from another state back east telling the guys here, hey, that's for all of us. That's not just for you. Right. So I, I just wanted to add that. I know you, we're running out of time here, but... I appreciate your call. All right, thanks. thanks. for bringing that up. Yeah, the, one of those things that we're dealing with is, is clearly because the, those problems are because these dictators from halfway across, the, from the other side of the country are telling us what to do. The, ty- the Ninth Amendment says, um, of, of the Constitution we talked about before, is these things, you know, these list of thou shalt nots with the Ninth and Tenth saying what they're allowed to, you know, saying, you know, if we forgot something, you're not allowed to do that either. And so we wanted to, to read what that, what does the Ninth Amendment say? Well, also, the, I think the preamble also to the Bill of Rights, it, it clarified the, the reason that we wrote the Ninth and Tenth. So before you read, if you're yeah. going to read that, yeah. the, the preamble to the Bill of Rights, talking about the Constitution, that in order to prevent misconstruction or abuse of its power, that further, de- further declaratory and restrictive clauses should be added meaning they added the Bill of Rights to prevent... They're restrictive on the federal abuse. government. Right. And so to prevent people abusing things like saying, oh, general welfare says we can do anything. Right? <laughs> we can do whatever we want. And, and so that, that's, that's, that was the, in the preamble to the Bill of Rights. Exactly. That's why we have the Ninth and Tenth Amendment, for example. The Ninth, the Ninth Amendment says the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny the, or disparage others retained by the people. So just because we didn't say you have the right to do something doesn't mean you don't have the right to do it. That's ridiculous. And so, and then the the, the Tenth Amendment says, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. So to reiterate the fact of what the the Article I, Section 8 is all about is enumerating certain authority that the state, that the federal government has that's exactly what it's about. The Tenth Amendment says, so if we haven't told you you can do it, you cannot do it. We can't say, but you didn't say we couldn't do it. No, that's not. Right. 
That's exactly. We said we didn't say you couldn't do it, which means you can't do it. Otherwise, can you imagine a list of things that we could say the federal government? Okay, you can't. The list would be infinity because I mean, basically because there's lots of things the federal government shouldn't be able to do, and that's what they were saying is we didn't tell you could do it, you can't do it, and if we didn't give you the right to do it because they they recognize that your rights don't come from the government. Your rights come from God, and the government's role is to protect them. So the Ninth Amendment restated that. Just because we didn't list these rights doesn't mean you don't have them. You have them. Right. They come from God. That's, that's the whole idea of natural law, right? Right. And, and the idea that this is just the way it is, regardless of the law of any nation. And the Constitution of the United States just did a good job of listing those already existing rights. Right. So even in other countries, if you have a tyrannical king ruling over, it doesn't mean those rights to, aren't inherent to any human being. Right. <laughs> and so, okay, so we, it's pretty much beat to death that the federal government has no authority over this land. Okay? Right? Uh, right. Absolutely. <laughs> didn't, didn't take a whole lot of time, but it's pretty plain. You know, you had, you had the old Senator Bob Bennett say, well, the Constitution can mean whatever people... Well, language words have meaning. Right. And if you read the words, it's really easy to understand what the Constitution means. Not up for interpretation. You can't do this. That's What, what other way can you interpret you can't do this? And especially when we have, like, the Federalist Papers and essays that were written by the <laughs> founders to try to explain this is what we meant for sure. For sure. Right. Right. If you don't understand you can't do this, then we'll explain what you can't do this means. Right. <laughs> so, so there's no reason for anyone not for anyone in a position w- w- where this matters to what you're doing to to find out. Okay, what did it really mean? You, it's, it's not open to interpretation. You, you know, at, at least you know the, the majority of it. There might be. I don't know. Is there any part of it that's like flexible? Mm, no, that will, they made it clear for that very reason because oh, okay. they knew that people. Okay. So none of it's flexible. All right. Bad people would try and, and flex stuff. Can we make up half of the stuff we do and just follow some of it? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> and and, and what, what lays that out especially is what was it, the 19th Amendment, if I remember correctly, that um, – and I'm getting it – I might be getting it wrong. The prohibition might be – I can't remember what number that was. You look that up real quick. I think that was 1920, wasn't it? It was the ninth. yeah. And so meaning that they had to pass an amendment to ban alcohol because – the Constitution didn't authorize the federal government to ban it. And so they understood that if you wanted to ban something, you had to add language to the Constitution. So, in other words, if the Constitution doesn't authorize the federal government, they knew they weren't allowed to do it. So they had to pass that. So if the federal government thinks that they should control the land, then you know what they have to do? They have to pass an amendment giving them authority to do so. But that hasn't happened. Okay, Amendment 18 was it was the 18th was Amendment prohibition, and then 19 was repeal of prohibition. So it was 18th and 19th. I knew it was right in there. But but that is the perfect example, like just like you said, of of enumerated powers. The people of the United States understood enumerated powers much better, you know, that hundred years ago <laughs> or so, and they they knew that federal government couldn't just make a law that says no alcohol. Right. It would it was common had to knowledge. The Constitution. It, the common knowledge of the people protected, actually protected the nation. So they had to actually modify the Constitution. And that hasn't changed today. It's just that the common knowledge of the people Has isn't changed. sufficient so that so that it's a common outcry of, you can't do that, right? Yeah, exactly. Randy. Yeah, I'm, I'm back. I, yeah. The, the, some of the arguments that the state of Utah and the western states are trying to make about acquiring their their lands have been argued before. There's one case you can look it up. It's called Nye County, which is Nye County, Nevada, versus the U.S. federal government over this very issue mm-hmm. because they, they felt that, they, that the uh, federal government didn't have a right, but it was established in that through, and there's been several other court cases. I don't recall the, the case's example, but they... Uh, uh, they put in there, the, the eastern states came in under a different clause of the uh, enabling of these states. Each state has enabling acts. Right. And like the state of Utah had in their enabling act, they signed on that these lands 
would be allocated to them by the federal government and what was not allocated be, be, would be managed by the federal government. But right. They had, they had homesteading, and they opened all these lands up. It, they had the whole western domain open, and the, and the ones that were uh, productive and able to be utilized were pretty much utilized. The things that were left over were, were lands that uh, uh, either had no water on them or had too much water in the form of snow through the winter months that they precluded somebody from uh, living on them year-round. Right. And so, so this is how this, the feds got into the management. But they, they maintained some of these as what they called forest reserves, and the, and the Constitution does allow reserves, uh, national defense reserves. Right. And, and that's how they... Uh, that's how they justify this, but uh, for under national, we got the Forest Service under you, national defense. That's pretty good. I, I'm okay. Uh, we're well, going off to a break. Sorry, we got to cut you off right there. Thanks for your call. So this is Ben McClintock and Enoch Moore on the Liberty Lineup. Think right and wrong, not right and left. We'll be right back talking about the lands. What's the solution? Ben McClintock and Enoch Moore of DefendingUtah.org are back on K-Talk Radio, AM 630, K-Talk.com with the Liberty Lineup, Naked Truth Segment, Think Right and Wrong, Not Right and Left, sponsored by EOS Mobile, the cell phone service for conservatives. And we've been talking about the lands transfer. There was a big uh, news conference yesterday on the lands transfer and, and uh, about the lawsuits around it. We wanted to kind of get into... What's, what's the right thing to do? And there's a, uh, a quote. Joseph Smith said that, I'm going to paraphrase it, that you can get to the truth by eliminating falsehoods. And so we can find out what's, what's right by getting just kind of going through and finding out what's, what's false. And so we, we've been able to show, I think, pretty uh, conclusively that the federal government has no authority over this land. Okay? So now. Most of it. <laughs> It, unless it's a fort, like you've got uh, maybe a fort like uh, right, right. Camp Williams or something. But uh, other than that, all, all of this you know, wilderness space, the uh, national parks, et cetera, no authority. Okay, now that brings us to what, 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 what's Ken Ivory doing? Is this the uh, proper alternative, or can we eliminate it as a falsehood because of it breaking certain key principles? Well, the Lands Transfer Act, that was 2012, mm-hmm. right, 2012. And if we read it, it has some concerning things right off the bat, right? So the, the big concern with people who understand lands issues and, pr- and property rights in the United States right now is Agenda 21. And we understand that that open space and sustainability and wilderness, while s- sometimes sound like good buzzwords to, to the unsuspecting public, are are really the back way for for re- removing property rights from the citizens. And that's just a small part of it. It gets into a family, it gets into education, it gets into Complete everything. control. Complete control of every aspect of your life according to their own documents, the original. Right. So Agenda 21, just kind of as a recap, real quick, of what Agenda 21 is. Back in 2000, 1992, I'm sorry, there was the uh, United, Na- non- uh, United Nations Conference in Rio de Janeiro where they came up with this sustainable development um, thing called Agenda 21. It was their agenda for the 21st century. That's what Agenda 21 comes from. And so, and they said in their own documents that what this means is we have to, is the, it's the realignment of, of all of society. And it gets into property rights, it gets into family planning, it gets into uh, all of these things. And one of their key buzzwords is sustainability, sustainable development. And so if you, that sounds like who doesn't want to be sustainable? Because if you're not sustainable, you, you go out, right? So they use these words, but now you need to look into, like, if you look at legislation. What do they mean when they say that? What do they that? mean? It right. right. If you look at legislation, a lot of bills have a section in the beginning of definition of words, meaning that, you know, you can't just go look up the words in the, in the dictionary for what they mean. And so for that bill, this is what they mean by when they say sustainable. And so Maurice Strong, he was one of the major authors of this Agenda 21 program. And what he said, sustainable means, it says we can't eat meat, we can't have air conditioning in your car, you can't have air conditioning at your home and your business, things like that. 
multiple, you know, too many children. The, these are the things that they're talking about when they're saying it's not sustainable. So when you're talking about sustainable development, they're trying, the, the end goal is to do this. And they just came up with their new plan. So that, that was for the 21st century, and they came up with a new one for, um, called Agenda 2030, which is kind of their 15-year plan, what they want to get done in the next 15 years. So, so that's kind of the high level of Agenda 21. And if you go to DefendingUtah.org, we have several articles on, on like Envision Utah, which is the primary driver of Agenda 21 in the state of Utah. Because they know they can't just come in here with their blue helmets and enforce it on us. They've got to be. It's got to be done through, through local, local organizations right, and through, local governments, through local programs. And so we won't beat that to death today, but we'll. But we'll go to defendingutah.org and you can find out all of the articles we've done on this topic because it's we go into a lot of detail and how it's being implemented here, what it is, and it's really important that you find that out because it's being done right under your nose. So. Anything re- because we were concerned about Agenda 21, anything related to lands, we were looking into. We were looking into, right? How is this affecting property? You know, because we kind of expected some someone somewhere was going to be s- trying to sneak Agenda 21 in locally because we know that's how it was being implemented. So because of that, we were we were reading uh, everything we could on these. And naturally, when a bill comes up that says let's take our lands back from the feds, well, that's exciting. But you know, it's related to lands, and so we're going to look at it, right? We're going to read it. And it initially, right off the bat, you start seeing these buzzwords, right, with wilderness areas and right. sustainability. It's like, okay, well, you know, maybe they're just kind of catering to the keyword. Maybe it means nothing, you know. It, but it right. was, it was a, right a off the bat. It was like a red flag for us to look up and say, hey, what's going on here? Yeah, it was just, it was just a red flag at first. And so um, there are a number – and we're going we're gonna to hit some key points to tell you some some really not good things in, in this bill. So if – if uh, you've been wondering about if this is a good idea or not, let, we're going to point out. And, it, why and it's I think not. we've established that we're not for the federal government having it. Mm-hmm. So, so by being against Ken Ivory's bill, that doesn't mean we're for what the federal government's doing. Obviously, what we want is a is a principled solution to bring it back to actually. If, if it's what you know, th- this is one of those things we get bait and switch all the time. And so, is it what we're being sold? Is it like the picture of the hamburger you see on the ad, where it's this big juicy thing and you get it and it's flat nastiness? Is that what was, what's happening with, with the lands bill? And so look, let's look at the language of what they've done. So let's talk about the Lorray McAllister Critical Land Conservation Fund. What does that have to do with getting our lands back or anything? <laughs> this is a fund that was established um, many years ago that was funded for a little bit and then for a while dried up. But now, coming out of the legislation that Ken Ivory has created, they called for significantly increasing the funding of this group. Well, what is this group? That was a big question when we saw that. So, 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 so to get our lands back, we need to increase funding to the Larray McAllister Conservation Fund. Uh, that's 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 what they're being. That's what we're being told, right? Yeah. So Just we kind of really looked that. into that, and when we looked into it, you know, we kind of saw the people in charge of it were. Um, it was it was a uh, uh, the the leadership of that group, so to speak, was appointed by Agenda 21 groups like the Utah Association of Counties and Utah League of Cities and Towns. Those are regional government groups. So if you're familiar with Agenda 21, you understand regionalism is... An SJR 13 that the state legislature passed, right? Right. SJR 11, I'm sorry. SJR 11. In 2013. Right. Labels those as Agenda 21 groups. So we're not just saying that. That's the state. And so we know that these Agenda 21 groups have put um, their influence in the Larray McAllister Fund, and now Ken Ivory says, let's give them a bunch more money. So a couple years later, after Ken Ivory's bill, they actually received the money. Right. And what does the Larray McAllister Fund do? They go to uh, landowners and buy their land perpetually, infinitely. But not. But they don't buy the land from them. It, they just... They, what they do is they they buy the rights. They buy the rights to development, and right. so the the owner of the property, they still own the land technically on the books, and they still have to pay their property taxes on the land, but they're never allowed to forever, ever, ever, ever. Anybody they sell the land to, has to, cannot develop the land. They cannot use it for development, and so they're buying up development rights. So they get all this land off limits to human use. So under the Transfer of Public Lands Act. They are taking away land out of public use forever and still charging the home, the uh, landowner for that land. 
and and what does that have to do with getting our lands back? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> does it does it look exactly like Agenda Twenty One? Yes. And isn't that why we want to take it away from the feds? Because we're worried to stop about Agenda Twenty One. Right. So uh, there's also in Ivory's bill uh, the next item pre-designation of wilderness areas and conservation areas, and and that's what we were trying to get away from. Um. And it pre-designates land to be off-limits, huge swaths of land to be off-limits to human use. And, and here's, here's the next question in, in Ivory's legislation and, and the reports that came out of it was, uh, was the ownership of the land. So this was item, let's see, explore. Okay, so the Interstate Compact and Public Lands. Explore the option of utilizing the Interstate Compact Clause of the United States Constitution to enter into a congressionally approved regional compact. Regional government. Me, under which the BLM and Forest Service lands in the West are transferred to the Western states under a public trust. Western states, not to the state of Utah, not to your county, but to this regional bureaucracy of, unele- of a group of, of unelected uh, officials telling us what to do with S- our land. States agreeing to the compact and trust agreement would pledge to keep the vast majority of lands open public access and to manage for sustainable prosperity and conservation again what do they mean with the word sustainable is, is the biggest question right and this isn't going to utah this is a tr- this is a regional trust a land trust this is an entity that is above state sovereignty exactly so we got um a, we got some calls on this uh falcon can uh, you're on the air what, do you have a question or comment on this um yeah, a little bit of everything. Uh, but before I go into my main topic, uh, since Real I don't quick, we don't have just a few minutes left before the break, but go ahead. Yeah. So, what are your names first? Because I I don't yeah, know. Ben McClintock and Enoch Moore on the Liberty Lineup: The Naked Truth. Okay, um, that's a pretty long name. Uh, so, I want to bring up an issue about land and uh, sovereignty uh, and just. Uh, what they call sustainability. Uh huh. All right. So I get into solar and various types of alternate energy. And so I do research occasionally. And I came across something recently where a few people in, I think in Florida is where I found one. And there may have been in, in some other States, they had their own power systems. They didn't need the grid, although the grid was available. So they disconnected and they just went with solar power. That sounds great. It sounds like they're really helping out the planet. But the SWAT team came in. So there's, you know, like one issue is like, why do you need SWAT? Right. And the issue, the issue was on what's called international property law, because there were no United States laws in place to disallow them from doing this. So they then had to revert to what now is called international property law. So now you see the globalists are bringing in their own so-called international law and and foisting this onto people in other countries. It even happened in Spain, I know wow. of. So it's all over the world, that is incredible. and they're trying to dominate everybody all over the world. Right. I couldn't understand why they would want to do this. But the best that I could figure out is that they don't want people not paying that fee because they, they're trying to make a sustainable grid. You know, like, like right now they're trying to, you know, I think it's Edison is trying to put lithium-ion batteries as as storage for wind power and solar panel so they could have power going back out on the grid at night. But, of course, lithium-ion batteries is a horrible way to store electricity. It's dangerous. It's expensive. They short circuit. It's just, it's a, it's just a grotesque way of storing power uh, for that purpose. Uh, so there's a lot of other technologies that are up and coming that, that look very promising for that. But I think – and this is where I want to play both sides of the fence. On one hand, I see seconds. where we need – What's that? Just 20 seconds. Sorry. Go ahead. Just letting you know. Oh, I can't finish what I'm going to say in 20 seconds. Um, so what, I want to play both sides of the fence here is you have up-and-coming technologies that look really good, and they could really help the grid out as well as help the people out. There's going to be competition between whether we pay the grid or we just get our own systems. That's happening. But on the other hand, what about the responsibility of society? Because I see a lot of negligence in society. So in, on, on, on that on that, with, with that respect, I'm thinking maybe these globalists realize that as a whole we're not that responsible, that we would tear up property, we would damage it, right. we're not going to be responsible for the wilderness. So that this kind of the view is like do we trust each other? Do, they, right. do the authorities trust us? Do we trust them? So there's a trust issue going on here too. Right. I, I don't mean to cut you off, but we needed to go to the break. 
we are it's it's a big thing and we can tell that that having the SWAT team go after somebody for sustainable energy you know for being able to be off the grid is obviously not an enumerated power and giving that to international body is just is out of control it's totally out of control yeah another big point of Ken Ivory's bill is that people don't know about is 95 percent of the um, of the proceeds of the sale of the proceeds of the sale go to who the federal government the federal government and so we're not even getting the we're not even getting the money for the transfer right it's it's a huge deal so those are the, the two options that we provided but is that the right thing to do a special thanks to our show sponsor EOS mobile the cell phone service that supports conservative candidates and causes go to EOScell.com for more information. It's Ben McClintock and Enoch Moore. Right back after the break, we'll be talking to the author of In Plain Sight. Welcome to the Thursday segment of the Liberty Lineup with Ben McClintock and Enoch Moore. This is the Naked Truth, where we think right and wrong, not right and left. And today... We are talking with the author of In Plain Sight. Um, I'm sorry, Hiding in Plain Sight, Ken Bowers. Hiding in Plain Sight, Ken Bowers. We'll be taking your questions at uh, 801 We'd like to thank our show sponsor, EOS Mobile, the only cell phone service that supports conservative candidates and causes. Go to EOSCELL.com for more information and mention the Liberty Lineup radio show. Did you know that you can listen to this show from anywhere online through k-talk.com? You can access our calendar and join our chat room. You can also like our Facebook page at K-Talk Utah and post photos to Instagram at K-Talk Radio and tweet our handle at KTKK. And best of all, download the K-Talk app through iTunes or Google Play. Last month alone, K-Talk was heard in 82 countries around the globe. So last, last segment we were talking about the lands transfer, and we're going to... We're going to do a little bit of, sh of a shift here. We are so blessed to have in studio Ken Bowers, the author of Hiding in Plain Sight. And this, he's a, uh, a local author here, native to, to Utah. Uh, I remember reading the first edition of your book um, right around the time when I first started waking up to, to the idea that there was actually a conspiracy. People were actually um, doing things evil on purpose. <laughs> shocking, you know. Yeah, shocking. Isn't <laughs> that, it? that was back in two thousand and one. Just I, actually, I read your book before nine eleven happened. Yes, uh -huh. and so that that that's kind of how how long I've been kind of following and knew about you and your in, in your book, and been really great to been blessed to be able to go to some of your events you've had here since in, in Utah, and um, just really glad to have you in studio. Well, um, thank you. We'd like to just turn you over, turn time over to you to. Introduce yourself. Okay. I'm, I suppose there are many people out there who do not know about me. I'm, I'm not exactly <laughs> on all the talk shows <laughs> around the country. But, Sean uh, Henry doesn't have you on every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Ken Bowers, and I was born and raised in Mesa, Arizona. And when I was a youngster, about 14, my parents joined the John Birch Society. This is back in the mid-60s, about 100 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they, they began to hold cottage meetings in our home. And uh, they started talking about the strangest things I'd never heard of before. They said that there was a cabal or a conspiracy of uh, rich and powerful people that controlled our government from behind the scenes. And when I first heard that, I was, I was dubious. I, I said, no, 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 hold on, that, that can't be. Uh, we, we are the ones who control our, uh, our representatives, our presidents, our senators. They do what we want. And if they don't do what we want, 
then we kick them out of office and put someone else in who will. We are the sovereigns in our nation, not the government. So I began to investigate this idea of a secret combination that controlled us from behind the scenes with the idea, with the motive of discrediting it. You didn't didn't, uh, quite believe it at first is what you're saying. No, no, I didn't. So I began to study it to find out the truth for myself. And after 45 to 50 years of investigating it, I can now say that they were right. The evidence points in that direction. There are many people who just don't believe it. But if they investigated the evidence, it's there. It's right in front of you, and it's very powerful. So um, you have to you have to uh, you have to approach it with an open mind, and that's how you approach the truth. And and the evidence, I think, is getting stronger and stronger almost every year. Uh-huh. Right? It's it's more obvious. Oh, Some yeah. people say it's not even a conspiracy anymore because it's not secret. They're almost <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and that is true. That is true. As they gain more power, then they are less fearful of letting us know, and they they do things very overtly. Of course, they always have an excuse or a rationalization or something uh, to, to try to make us think that it is something else. Uh, but um, uh, this conspiracy truly is hiding in plain sight. It is right in front of us. But the evidence of it, uh, they they say, oh, well, you're, you think you're looking at a conspiracy, but you're actually looking at something else. It's mm-hmm. this, or it's that, or it's the other thing. It is not a conspiracy when it really is. <clears throat> so what got you into to writing, to writing the book? Well, uh, in 1998, I said to myself finally, after investigating it for 40 years or so, I said, well, now I finally understand what's really going on. So I began to write. And I published it in 2001, first edition. The second edition came out in 2010. But when I first published it... And you did publish it before 9-11, right? Before 9-11, I did. When I published published it, uh, W. Cleon Skousen read my book. And through a friend... He got in contact with me and asked me to come over to his house. And he said to me, Ken, your book has the potential to become a classic. And I go, oh, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, you talking to me? (laughs) We were alone in the room. (laughs) Are you talking to me? And he said, "Your, your book has a wealth of information. And he said, I would like you to come and work for me. So for the last four years and I think four years and nine months of his life, I worked with him on many projects, and he taught me a lot of things, um, especially about the Constitution. I thought I knew the Constitution well, but he uh, he taught me many things about it, and um, he agreed totally, wholeheartedly, that there is this great, big, giant, pervasive, but hidden conspiracy. Uh, so uh, I've been, uh, he, he told me then that I needed to start uh, doing lectures, so I have been doing lectures from 2001 till now, and I have been all over the western United States, and I've given hundreds of lectures here in Utah and been on dozens of radio shows. So uh, it is a pleasure for me to be here with you today, and uh uh, I would like to be able to talk about some of the things that I found in my book. Um, yeah. Which um, Which would you like me to start <laughs> out with first? <laughs> well, so, kind of, I guess let's let's see here. We've got it. I'm just checking the time to make sure what we want to get into. Five minutes to the break. What um, have have things changed a lot since you wrote the book? How, you've come out with a second edition. Mm-hmm. And so one thing that I find that I guess let's just address this and then 
we can maybe kind of get in a little bit right before the break, and we'll get into more detail some of the things with politics going on today. What With the second edition, what are some of the differences? And if you were to do a third edition today, what are some of the things you might throw in there? Well, with the second edition, I added six chapters. I added two or three chapters just on 9-11. Wow. Because <laughs> here's the crazy thing. They started producing my book in in August, and September 11th of 2001 happened. And I, I, I called my uh, publisher and said, oh, please, let, stop production. Let me put something in about it. And he said, oh, no, oh, no, we're halfway through. We, we've already produced them. We're not going to stop now. Gotcha. So I, I waited until, until 2010, and I added two or three chapters on 9-11. Then I added other chapters. I have six different chapters. So it, it. Well, yeah. would, you add, would you add anything new today, or do you think you got it kind of laid out I, for people to understand? I think I would add something that i didn't that was not on the agenda in in 2010 uh, and that would be common core education mm -hmm. and um about um uh, the abuses of the government uh, uh that have taken place after 9/11 um and uh about these these endless wars that we're fighting against terrorism which is no real threat um I would encourage everyone to get to go on to YouTube and get a video, a 10-minute video by a man by the name of Aaron Russo, who was a Hollywood producer, who became acquainted with one of the Rockefellers, Nicholas Rockefeller, and Rockefeller told him 11 months before 9/11, he I, told I remember that. you remember that. Yeah. He said that there would be an incident or an event that would happen. And from that, he, he never said what the event would be. He said from that event, we would invade Afghanistan to establish um, uh, natural gas pipelines. We would then invade Iraq and, and take over the oil fields of Iraq. And we would uh, also go after Venezuela, uh, Chavez in Venezuela, but uh, that never happened. But then 11 months after he told this to Aaron Russo, we had 9-11. And then our government goes after that, goes after Afghanistan and Iraq. Now, you know, it just stretches, it stretches the imagination that people can deny that mm -hmm. to this day and say, oh, no, 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 no. It wasn't a conspiracy from the elite, but it was. And Aaron Russo said, the, the war on terror is a farce. It's not true. Yeah, we're, we're fighting a war in Iraq. That's because we invaded Iraq. <laughs> <laughs> but there is no war on terror. It's an invented false flag terrorism. We had the CEO of the John Birch Society, Art Thompson, uh, uh -huh. interviewed him on our show, and he explained that exact same thing. He says the terror triangle is Beijing, Washington, D.C., and Moscow, and, and all these staged events uh, come from within that within triad. That, that triad mm -hmm. right? and, and their goal is, of course, to, <clears throat> to get more, more government power, and that's what we can notice. Terrorism is a government uh, action that is for, for political purposes. Okay. And who's gotten more political gain out of this? The U.S. government getting more power, or uh, is al-Qaeda getting more uh, land and taking over the United States? Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> both are getting more powerful. The well, war on terror is a colossal failure. I think it gives them more power, but they're not really taking over. The, you don't have al-Qaeda no. taking over our government. Uh, not, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> ISIS and al-Qaeda came from this so-called war on terror. Right. And it well, al Qaeda originating back in the 80s, but, but 20 ISIS. Seconds, 20 seconds. So, so, okay, when we come back from the break, we'll be talking about <laughs> things that are going on today. This is Ben McClintock and Enoch Moore, and we are talking with Ken Bowers, the author of Hiding in Plain Sight. Do they have a website they can check out? No, but I, 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 will, I would like to talk about uh, people I at the last part. If people want to get hold of me, I'll give out my phone number and they can contact me. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. This is Ben McClintock and Enoch Moore. And we are talking again with Ken Bowers. Right after the break, we'll be getting more details about what's going on today.
Ben McClintock and Enoch Moore. We are back on K-Talk Radio, AM 630, k-talk.com, with the Liberty Lineup Naked Truth segment sponsored by EOS Mobile, the cell phone service for conservatives. And we are talking with Ken Bowers, the author of Hiding in Plain Sight. And we wanted to, to get into what's going on with uh, – is. Are we still dealing with the conspiracy, especially with the – we got the presidential election coming up, and mm-hmm. we got all that stuff going on. What do you yeah. think about that? Well, I think that it is a travesty because um, this conspiracy is so powerful <clears throat> that it controls both political parties, the Republicans as well as the Democrats. And that's something I'd like to talk about because here – Wait a it, second. Aren't the Republicans uh, the family party, and they're the ones to, to hold back those pesky Democrats? Oh, yeah. It, it, uh, <clears throat> the the belief is <laughs> that the Republicans will save our country while the Democrats will destroy it. Right. And that is all uh, – that's the party line. That's Does that mean you're supporting <laughs> the Democrats? Absolutely not. <laughs> it's kind of like the, the wolf versus the wolf in sheep's clothing, right? The Democrats yeah. are the outward wolf. And That's they, obviously a danger to us. Yeah, but the, the, the Republicans are, have the sheep's clothing on. I, <clears throat> let me uh, let, let let's talk about that because that's an important thing. Uh, when I was a student at BYU uh, about a hundred years ago, <laughs> in 1972, I uh, I was in the uh, BYU bookstore one day and I came across a book, let's see, called uh, The Powers That Be by G. William Domhoff. Now, Domhoff was a professor of sociology at the University of California at uh, Santa Barbara. Um, I'm not sure whether he's alive or dead today. He's probably passed on, but back in 72, he wrote this book not as a political book, but as a sociological study, and his view was He wanted to show the influence that the power elite had on society and what what effect that had on society. So it was a sociological study. And I began reading it, and he talked about all the things that I believed in. For instance, let me quote right out of his book here. He says, In the candidate selection process, it is the means by which elective offices are filled. Well, of course, that's true. It is a process in which most politicians develop binding ties to one or another clique with the power elite, all the while professing to speak for the people. Okay? So they develop this these ties Sounds with the familiar. power elite, and yet out of the other side of their mouth they say, they, I am a man or woman of the people. So, many of the largest donors, the power elite, their donors, they give to both parties. In 1972, for example, 36% of the 10,000 and over donors gave to candidates of both parties. And at that time, it was Nixon and McGovern. Whatever the motivation for these split gifts, they help give members of the power elite access to both political parties. They don't just give them access. They give them control. (laughs) You just have to take it one step further there. Now, that has continued from that day to this. For instance, I'll tell you right here now that in the last presidential election, both Obama and Romney got gifts or uh, heavy donations from the same people, the same organizations, Goldman Sachs, um, uh, uh, the uh, Chase Manhattan, uh, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, many of these large banks and investment firms gave to both of them. But that brings up a question: Why would they give to both? Aren't they? Aren't they Opposites? ideological? Aren't they? Aren't the? Isn't the power elite ideologically? And the I, the mindset is that they would never that Mitt Romney because he's such a good Mormon and has held positions that he wouldn't he would never be influenced by such donations, right? <laughs> my my response to that is how can you not be? 
they, 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 they will never give out tons of money, millions of dollars to both Romney and Obama. They will not give that out without expecting some cooperation from these men. Let me, uh, let me quote you again from another one. Uh, uh, this is from the book um, FDR, My Exploited Father-in-Law. <laughs> okay. uh, it's from Curtis Dahl, who was the son-in-law of FDR. He said, many people say it is impossible to start a third party because of the cost difficulty in getting an organization set up to manage it. And in some respects, that is true. However, a third party is in reality a second party because of the joint ownership or working control of both Democratic and Republican parties centered in New York by the One World Money, One World Power group. So he saw it right. He, he, was saw, he saw right there in his family. That right. He saw what his father-in-law, FDR, was doing. And he took he took orders from a group called the Council on Foreign Relations. Mm -hmm. The Council on Foreign Relations is a non-democratic, non-constitutional group that controls our presidency from behind the scenes. And I would like to run a 30-second video, which you can't see, but you can hear the audio. The video, this video is of Hillary Clinton, former Secretary of State, addressing uh, the Council on Foreign Relations. And she talks about going to the mothership, which is the headquarters in New York City, and that they opened a new outpost of the council right down the, uh, the, the street from the State Department. So she talks about this, and I would like to go ahead and play that. Is, is that can we do that? Yeah. Thank you very much, um, Richard, and I am delighted to be here in these new headquarters. Um, I have been often to, uh, I guess, the mothership in New York City. Uh, but it's good to have an outpost of the council right here down the street from the State Department. Uh, we get a lot of advice from the council, so this will mean I won't have as far to go to uh, be told uh, what we should be doing and uh, how uh, we should uh, think about the future. I mean, That's huge. <laughs> be told what to do and how to think. Yeah. We've got to go to the CFR to be told what to do and how to think. Let me tell That's you. That's the public education of our politicians. <laughs> <laughs> what to do, how to think. Let me ask you this. Where in the Constitution does it mention the Council on Foreign Relations? These people, That's the 28th Amendment, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> These people are part of the power elite. They tell our president what to do, and a Hillary Clinton in a video that was not supposed to get out... <laughs> frankly admits it. That that wasn't on NBC Nightly News? No. no. <laughs> oh, well, I think I missed that night. <laughs> Stuff like this happens all the time. And we find members of the Council on Foreign Relations in, in Utah. all over the place, in Utah. They mm -hmm. actually um, meet in Utah they regularly. Actually, they actually do meet in Utah. Mm -hmm. and, and we find it on lots of alternative media sources that sometimes we even think we can trust. It's surprising the connections you find. With yeah. CFR. Yes. Now, people might ask the question, how, why, why should, why is it that the two parties, uh, why you say the two parties are controlled? Well, I'd like to answer that by a third quote from the book Tragedy and Hope by Carol Quigley, mm -hmm. which is a, an expose of, um, uh, Carol Quigley, he was a Georgetown uh, professor. Of history. <laughs> um, and George, Bill Clinton said that uh, he was his mentor. That's right. And and he influenced Bill Clinton in yeah. his presidency, although at the time he was he was dead. Quigley right, was that, dead, right. but he still had influence over Clinton even yeah. after his death. And he wrote this huge book called Tragedy and Hope, and it's basically a history of Western civilization from about the time of Columbus to the day that it was published in 1966. And he said this about the two, quote, different political parties. Carol Quigley said, The argument that the two parties should represent opposed ideals and policies is a foolish idea. 
Instead, the two parties should be almost identical so that the American people can throw the rascals out at any election without leading to any profound or extensive shifts in policy. The policies that are, are vital and necessary for America, and I would substitute the word for the power elite, they want us to think that it's good for America, but it actually benefits the power elite. The policies that are vital and necessary for the power elite are no longer subjects of significant disagreement, but are disputable only in details. But either party in office becomes in time corrupt, tired, and vigorous, and, and you know, that's, that's true. Then it should be possible to replace it every four years, if necessary, by the other party, which will still pursue with new vigor approximately the same basic policies. So there's a good chance that following this plan we'll have a Republican this time yeah. in the presidency. So, but this is something that I get as a response a lot when, when we bring up these kind of points is that, well, it was when Obamacare was voted on, it was all the Democrats. It didn't get one Republican vote. So they're obviously different because that would have never have passed if we had Republicans in there. What do you say to <laughs> stuff like that? That is that is not true. I, there are stronger words that I could say. <laughs> but I will say that is not true, and I'll give you the proof of that. In 2004, our dear President Bush sponsored the um, uh, Medicare, uh, the, the prescription drug supplement to Medicare and it was the stepping yeah, stone to Obamacare. Yeah, it was yeah, stepping stone to Obamacare. And that uh prescription drug program, he pushed through helped push through Congress with the Republicans. The Republicans at that time controlled both houses of Congress and yet they voted for this unconstitutional bill for bigger and bigger government. Bigger and bigger government. But when you look at it, the Democrats in 1965 passed Medicare and Medicaid with LBJ, the Democratic president, and a Democratic-controlled House of Congress. So both of them worked for uh, a nationalization of the, of the medical system through these uh, socialistic measures. Both parties did it, and people still say there's a real difference between the Republicans and Democrats. And so it, it looks like when you look at people's voting record, you look at Orrin Hatch's over the years, you can tell it's, it's really a show because when he's – when you have a Republican president, his voting record is very unconstitutional. But when you have a Democrat president, his voting record gets better. So it, he's playing a part, it seems like, to make it look like there's a difference. But then once they have the power, they do the same exact stuff. They do the same exact stuff. They mouth conservative principles when they're running, but they do liberal pr principles when they're elected right. from their bosses. They get these uh, marching orders from their bosses. Now, I'd like to introduce uh, some other evidence here, and this is on the local level. <laughs> I have, local poli they're all from Utah. They're all honest, right? Yeah. They all have our best interests, support the Constitution. Oh, yeah, they never all do support wrong. the Constitution. And I'm going to – I received back in 2004, I believe it was, uh, two flyers, uh, one from Congressman Jim Matheson, and this is his own words. I'm going to quote his own words. His, his own flyer. And, the, and, uh, <laughs> and everybody knows that Jim Matheson was a liberal Democrat. Then I also received one from Rob Bishop. And everybody knows that Rob Bishop is a conservative Republican. Well, let's compare them. Kill let's it. just compare them <laughs> in their own words. See how constitutional they are. Okay, Congressman Jim Matheson bragged about this. He said, I got $5 million in the U.S. House for the Pratt Trail connecting the Bonneville shoreline, the Jordan River Parkway. I got $5.4 million in the U.S. House for the Bingham Junction Boulevard in Midvale. I got $2 million in the U.S. House for Holiday Village for the Holiday Village Center pedestrian improvements. I, got so, I bet you those guys in Texas are real glad their tax money went to, went to fund the stuff in Utah, right? Yeah, how about that? Isn't that <laughs> wonderful? Five million in the U.S. House for the Cottonwood and Winchester intersection in Murray City. Two million in the U.S. House to fund Salt Lake's Youth City program. Well, my question to you, Mr. Matheson, is where in the Constitution does it provide for um, uh, all this money for local projects like this. Where is this power given in the, in, the, um, in the U.S. Constitution? Well, it isn't, Mr. Matheson. 
Therefore, I'm going to make a very strong statement. That makes you a liar, Mr. Matheson, because you took an oath of office to defend the Constitution, and these things are blatantly unconstitutional, Mr. Matheson. But, on the other hand, <laughs> we have the conservative Republican. Who would never do anything like that. Oh, who would never do anything <laughs> like that because he defends the Constitution. Of and that would be Rob Bishop. I got this other uh, mailer from him. So I'm going to quote to you in his own words. One minute. Sorry. Okay. He said, um, Medicare. I voted for the new prescription drug benefit under Medicare to allow seniors access to more affordable medicines. His own words. Well, Mr. Matheson, where in the Constitution does it give you the authority to... So this Republican uh, voted for more government control over our medicine. Yes, and guess what? Jim Matheson voted this, voted yes right along with Rob Bishop. How about this? Energy. I am working towards a national energy policy. Well, where in the Constitution <laughs> does it say we should have a national energy policy? Uh, the last one, education. As a former teacher, I will continue to work with the state in dealing with no child left behind and promote more local control over our children's education. Well, why don't you sponsor a bill to... Get rid of no child left behind. For sure. This is Ben McClintock and Enoch Moore, and after the break, we'll continue talking with the author of In Plain Sight. We'll be right back after the break. Hi. This is Ben McClintock and Enoch Moore back on K-Talk Radio, AM 630, k-talk.com, with the Liberty Lineup Naked Truth segment sponsored by EOS Mobile, the cell phone service for conservatives. And we are talking with Ken Bowers, the author of, and I will get the title right, Hiding in Plain Sight. Hiding in Plain Sight. If you don't have that book, some of the Deseret Books have it I've seen it at. You can buy it on Amazon, right? Amazon.com. And uh, so it's a, if you don't have Hiding in Plain Sight by Ken Bowers, you need to pick it up. And um, we've got uh, somebody calling. The, Rick Wild said hi and to keep up the good work. <laughs> Rick, how are you, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> He's an old friend of mine. It's good to hear from you, my friend. And um, something that, that comes up a lot, and that's why we actually started Defending Utah, the organization that anybody, our listeners, can look at, DefendingUtah.org, was to be part of a solution, be actively doers of the word, and not here is only. Something that I say is that I don't want to be the most informed person in the concentration camp, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we've got to do something about it. Who cares what we know if we're not going to act? Okay. And so we've got a caller on the line. Um, we've got CC wants to know what to do about it. You got a comment? Yeah. You know, we talk about this stuff. You were just talking about how, you know, Mr. Matheson, you know, how is it constitutional for you to get the money? from the federal government like you did and put it towards the local projects and stuff. I mean, there's so many different things right now that we are off we're off the Constitution of the United States. That's probably why we're broke. I mean, that's pretty much it. That's why the numbers aren't working. Right. True. Um, you, you know, you've got to figure it this way. Okay, you got, you got here, here's a prime example. Okay, you had Senator Mike Lee come in, right? Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and according to his conservative constitutional voting on, on, a, on a rating scale that they have. I guess he's about 100%, right? So he's yeah. pretty constitutional, pretty uh, conservative. He's, he's pretty good. Pretty close. Now you're going to have to vote him out because you're going to have to change him out to get someone else in there that needs to be constitutional as well and do it as a civic duty. Mm-hmm. Because we've created this monster called the federal government, and we gave them so many things that it's unsustainable where they're at right now. Right. That's why we're broke. That's why the numbers aren't working. Now, if everyone went in and did their civic duty and left, and everybody, all the voters, voted these people in and voted them out, changed the incumbent out consistently every voting time, then you'd ha- you, 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 you could rid this problem and create your own term limits. Right. And, and that's kind of where we're going to have to do what we're going to have to do. I mean, I just don't see anybody else any other way around it. You know, and eventually some of these people, as they get changed out cons- consistently, 
they're going to say, wow, maybe we should make it illegal for senators and congressmen. Let's just get rid of lobbying altogether <laughs> right. for money. Lobbying for money. If you're caught lobbying for money, you go to the federal prison system and you play mm. tennis for 10 years. <laughs> well, that's something because, that it's really a, this. Thanks for the call. Appreciate it, CC. Um, that really, this is a reflection on us who are we're, we're electing over and over again. Yes, we just keep on. It, 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 it's like I, what Einstein said: uh, 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 to do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result is the the perfect definition of insanity. This is crazy. Oh, let's reelect a Democrat this time, and it gets worse. Oh, let's le- elect a Republican this time, and it gets worse. Oh, let's go back to the Democrat. Now let's go back to the Republican. Well, they're the ones that are responsible for this government. I mean, you can't blame third-party candidates for the problem we're in because there's practically none. There's almost no independent uh, uh representatives or senators or anything in government. Right. They're all Republicans and Democrats. They are the ones who are responsible, and we just can't see it. And what are the ones that keep picking them? So you could even say that, I mean, I believe it really the, the blame essentially comes back on us. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we just refuse to see what's really going on. You'll never get it by supporting the major party candidates. Well, we let them get away with it. Whatever party they are, we let them get away with it. Over by, you have a ninety-five percent uh, re-election rate. That's, yeah. that's our fault. That's crazy. That's crazy stuff. Now there is now, an argument for you know when is there voter fraud and when is there not. You know, do we really have a voice? But but generally, I think that's true. Right. Okay. Now, as for the solution to this, my advice is. Desert the Republicans. Desert the Democrats. They're, they will give you, you elect those two parties, and you're going to get the status quo. But we don't need the status quo. We need a solution. We need to turn about and go in the opposite direction because they're going towards big government. We need small government. Now, there is a party that I support that is dedicated to the Constitution in the vision of the Founding Fathers. And it's called, surprise of surprises, the Constitution Party. <laughs> <laughs> and they are a, they are a viable uh, party here in Utah. I'm a member of it. In fact, I'm, if it wasn't for the Constitution Party, we have an article on this on our website that was written by the, the head of the Utah Constitution Party, uh-huh. Bryce Hamilton, yes. that talks about the, the count my vote fraud. Uh-huh. And in fact... And this is, this is something we know from behind the scenes and the research that we did at Defending Utah that was able to help Bryce with his work with the Count My Vote SB 54 lawsuit. If, it w- if we left it up to the Republican Party, that lawsuit would have been done. The, um, the article talks about how the Re- Republican Party, and this isn't um, an endorsement of parties. We don't do that here, but just telling you the facts of what actually happened. If it was up to the Republican Party, the, the lawsuit would have been lost and thrown out. It was the work of the Constitution Party throwing out false people, people that were promoting to be um, neutral that were not, and threw them out, and was able to do th- actually file the uh, documents necessary to actually get the lawsuit to, well, at least the, the portion that we've had a victory on, to, to be thrown out. If, yes. if it wasn't for them, it wouldn't have happened. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they are a small party, the Constitution Party I'm right. talking about. But they are dedicated to our Constitution. And we, I mean, I'm talking to the majority people here, the the LDS people are are supposed to be dedicated to the Constitution because we believe that it was inspired of God. Mm -hmm. Well, if if that's true, then we should adhere to the Constitution in its original form. And demand our elected officials. Adhere and to it. Adhere to it, and and if they don't, let's join the let's join the Constitution Party. I I would encourage you to do that. You can get information on it. Can I do this? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, you can get information on the Constitution Party by going on your um, uh, website to the uh, website of uh, let's see, uh, um, cputah.org. cputah.org. Go get on it. Join the join the party. Let's get rid of these Democrats and Republicans who are the plague of all our problems. They're 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 the center of all our problems. 
Um, let's see. In, in the art of war, there's why why it's important to understand who these conspirators are. In the you art of war, to. Sun Tzu said that if you understand yourself and you understand your enemy, you will not be imperiled in a hundred battles. But if you only right. understand yourself, like if we just understand the Constitution, but we don't understand the threat to liberty, we're going to lose half of our battles. It's essential that we understand who our enemy is, as Absolutely. much as we know the correct principles. Uh, 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 J. Edgar Hoover put it like this. He said, in any struggle, it is essential to know both what you are fighting for and what you are fighting against. If, if knowledge of the former is lacking... The will to win will be absent. If knowledge of the latter is absent, confusion and uncertainty will result. So you don't know what you're fighting for, you won't, you won't have the motivation to win. If you don't know what you're fighting against, your enemy can deceive you. And it's happening all the time. Especially with the Republicans and Democrats, <laughs> <laughs> we think if we just get the right guy elected, it'll it'll be better this time. You know, like it no. reminds me of the uh, the image of of Lucy pulling the uh, football out from Charlie Brown. Yeah. She promises <laughs> never to do it again. <laughs> okay, uh, may I insert uh, some personal observations? Sure. Here? Yeah. Um, for those, for anyone who's interested in. Um, in, in in what I've had to say, mm-hmm. I give twenty lectures. I have a a twenty lecture series that I give, and I've given them all over the Western United States, hundreds of places. And if you would like to get some lectures in your home, call me at eight oh one six six nine four zero seven two. If you want to hear more about the Constitution as it should be and about the secret combination which is destroying our country, call me at 801-669-4072, and I'll be glad to make arrangements with you to come to your house or to your organization, wherever it may be, and we can. I will give you these 20 lectures. Great. I recommend, I recommend everybody do that. We've got Eagle on the line. Eagle, thanks for calling in. What's up? Uh, thanks for letting me on uh, your show. Uh, uh, it's very, very interesting. I would like you to understand that what Carol Cl- Quigley had to say is totally true, but he said it on a national basis, and I'm saying that the uh, same type of apparatus is uh, here in Utah alive and well, and I say that because I was a part of it at one time. And let me just say this is a generality, but you can check everything I say if you're willing to pick up a paper in the state archives called the Utah Independent. Myself and uh, five other people supported Orrin Hatch because we were represented by 47 East South Temple. He was a good, good man. And that lasted for about three years, and then he went the way of, of hell. Now, I would say watch this Senator Lee because he's the same, uh, he belongs to that same apparatus. When he is needed and he has uh, placed his name in a conservative place in the the, uh, uh, minds of the people, he may speak up and he will go the other way. I would just say this about the founding fathers. They were conservative. They wanted to do away with everything that the British Empire wanted them to do. So, you know, that conservative uh, um, uh, liberality is just generality. you got to look at it a little bit closer now. I, I hope you do that. Thank you very appreciate much it, for your time. Hey, if you can hold on, I want to talk to you after the show. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank me, you. Me too. Appreciate your call, Eagle. So with that, we've got just a, just a minute left. Let's, if you want to call Ken Bowers, the author of Hiding in Plain Sight, that you can buy online at Amazon. If you want to have his lectures, give him a call. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, let me give you that uh, phone number one more time. Call me at 801-669-4072. I'd love to come and talk to you in your homes. You uh, can also, if you have trouble reaching him, you can always contact Defending Utah, and we'll help facilitate that as well. Yep. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Yeah. I think it would be a good thing for anybody that wants to have that, those lectures to, to be a part of and to pick up that book. 
and to be able to get that information. If we don't understand what's going on, we can't really do something about it. We'll, we'll keep being fooled by the same people over and over again. And uh, so we have a special thanks to our sponsor, EOS Mobile, the cell phone service that supports conservative candidates and causes. Go to EOSCELL.com for more information and mention the Liberty Lineup radio show. Tomorrow, remember the Hollywood Y guy, and the, he'll be, uh, and uh, also every tomorrow, 10 to noon. This is Ben McClintock and Enoch Moore from DefendingUtah.org. DefendingUtah.org. This is The Naked Truth, and we'll be back next Thursday, 10 to noon. Have a great week. <laughs>